Hey listeners, we're nearing the end of our 15th anniversary fundraising campaign and we need your help to meet our goal. This campaign offers you a chance to win a unique food and music experience in one of the most exciting cities in America. Here's how it works. Donate to HRN and you'll be entered to win dinner for two and two tickets to a concert in one of eight amazing cities. New York, Los Angeles, Philadelphia, Nashville, Las Vegas, Charleston, Ardmore, Pennsylvania, and Asheville. All donations support our work educating food system storytellers. And when you donate, you can choose one of those cities and you'll be entered to win dinner and two tickets to a show. So help us reach our goal and enter to win dinner and a show in the city of your choice. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15. Thank you. You're listening to Heritage Radio Network. Since 2009, Heritage Radio Network podcasts have been exploring the wide world of food, beverage, and agriculture. Learn more at heritageradionetwork.org. This episode is brought to you by 818 Tequila, delicious and smooth tequila, made in harmony with the earth. 818 Tequila, imported by 818 Spirits, Manhasset, New York. 40% alcohol by volume, drink responsibly. This episode is brought to you by Bento Box, a full-service marketing and commerce platform that helps restaurants get discovered, make more money, and engage their diners. Join over 8,000 restaurants already using Bento Box today to deliver better hospitality. Visit getbento.com slash chef today to get your first month free. That's getbento.com slash chef. This is part two of my interview with Tim and Carissa Mondavi. We'll talk about their winery continuum. They'll answer our wine list and we'll taste the continuum for our weekly wine sip. Enjoy. I want to talk about continuum. All right. Oh, good. We need to do that (laughs) because at some point I got to get you out of here. So it's an estate winery, you know, where you own the land and you grow the grapes. Um, But I'm interested in this because after years of doing this show, I've kind of moved towards this interest. You know, yesterday, Edward Chadwick talked about Sena kind of becoming organic, biodynamic. And that's important to me. Um, I want you to tell me about farming practices. Sure. Um, It took me a while to kind of figure out what it was, but when I found out, you know, I was very happy. But tell me, we talked about wine grower being important. We talked about the grape and the field being important. Tell me about your practices out there. Okay. Well, first of all, I'll tell you about our setting because our setting affects our practices. Um, uh, continuum is Oakville with altitude. Okay. Attitude so also. incredible. Uh, we are just above our old, with a little. We are just above our old digs at Robert Mondavi Winery and, and Opus One on the east side of the valley. We have west we have all the classics, you know, fabulous. It's westerly exposure, southerly exposure. There's complexity in some of the exposures. The altitude is from thirteen hundred to sixteen hundred feet. It's great um, altitude. It is. It is absolutely right in there. Um, and Napa Valley is only four percent of the wines of California, but uh, the hillsides are maybe four percent of the wines of Napa Valley. They are nestled into the Garrigue. They're nestled in to the vegetation. So you're saying the hillside is four percent of the four percent of what Napa is. That's right. Okay. Okay. So it's very tiny. It's very tiny. Uh, all the hillsides were abandoned uh, after Prohibition. But anyway, we've come back to this area because we believe that there is great potential in sites that cause the vines to struggle. So um, uh, Napa Valley, the uh, so the, the land that we have is volcanic in nature. The Mayacamas range is more marine derived, okay, because of geologic issues. And I could talk 
also about that. But the, but the, the Vaca Range, where uh, Pritchard Hill is, where we are, is um, on volcanic soil, which is low in fertility, high in minerality. And so the vines good are... Good drainage? Very good drainage. And uh, the, the shrubbery that envelops our vineyard are scrub oak, uh, uh, manzanita, uh, California bay laurel, um, and it is uh, it is the um, uh, the um, oh what's the the it's it's biodynamically diverse. It has a tremendous uh, heterogeneity, but it is all witness of this lower fertility soil. You look across the valley to the the. Myakamas range, which is more marine derived with uh, volcanic outcroppings, but it's more marine derived, which is intrinsically more fertile. So the vegetation is greater, there's redwoods, there's pine trees, there's all this huge vegetation. And also what we see is the afternoon shade, but what we, we are on the afternoon sun side, morning sun as well as afternoon sun. So all of these things set us up for success. Our south facing is open to the San Francisco Bay. You can feel that fog coming off of the Pacific Ocean. Wow. You know, you can f- hear Mark Twain saying that the coldest uh, winter he ever spent was a summer in San Francisco. And with that, uh, you can feel not only the, uh, the sparse soil conditions, but also the cooling breezes off of the San Francisco Bay that come into the afternoon. Both of them give the minerality and the uh, nerve that our wines, that I think great wines have, that need to have to be truly great. So I was very lucky to find this site. But there is a biodiverse ecosystem within what we have. Also, we manage our vineyards ourselves. Our, everybody in the vineyards, I've been fortunate to have people that I have worked with for 35 years, 40 years. Uh, and uh, you, you have people retiring on you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> They've been around yeah, so long, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Cindy just, re- well, a couple. Um, Recruits from back from Robert McDonald. Yeah, Madonna right. Days. Cindy yeah. Nagy. People that well, you trust and know absolutely. for so long. Opus One. Opus, the right. Opus One was Stu Harrison. Stu Harrison is a great guy. Philippe Cotin uh, said that we need to protect Opus, protect this baby. We need it to stand on its own. We need advocates that will look out for opus. And uh, that means when you get in the marketplace, um, you know, we need to fend off all the uh, pulls by Mouton Cadet or Woodbridge. It has to find its own place. And so Stu was the opus one. And so Mm -hmm. after he left there and had some externships, I asked him to come back to help lead the R path for continuum into the marketplace. And he and Carissa and I helped identify the where, who, who would be like-minded because, oh, Continuum is so tiny, so tiny, and it's a baby. It needs to be protected. And so we it had to... Still. It still does. So <laughs> as a, not as an outsider, but compared to Mondavi, it's tiny. I mean, it's a beautiful piece of property. It's not a tiny piece of property. Your output doesn't match you know, oh, some of the other stuff. Yeah. But, I mean, we're not talking like 12, 14 backyard acres. I mean, oh, we're, no. We're no. talking about a beautiful flat piece of property at the top of... Well, it's... Uh, flat it's and a, hill. I, <laughs> I retract the word flat. Yeah. yeah. But you do meadow out at some point. Well, we have we have gentle slopes. Right. We have even slopes. If you evaluate what makes Grand Cru's Grand Cru, there is a slope that is even, that is where you can do the balancing act of balancing the vine to the site the fruit to the vine, all of that, the wine making to the fruit, because there is an evenness of aspect. Uh, and so we've got uh, 173 acres of land, 71 are dedicated to vines, 44 blocks. Uh, uh, continuum is planted 55% to Cabernet Sauvignon, 30% to Cabernet Franc, uh, 10% Petit Verdot, 5% Merlot. It is evolving. I was surprised to see that. More Cabernet Franc. I was surprised to see that you had, you know, the five Bordeaux blending varietals, you know, fairly well represented. Well, there are only only four. Four. We don't have have Malbec. There's no Malbec. 
I didn't care for Mulvaney. No, I know. Uh, I know nor that. Carminari for I, and it here. Took me, it took me a little time to find the Merlot plot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, know, yeah. Well, it's a small amount. <laughs> yeah. Because, uh, again, it's a holdover from my recognition from the Valley Floor. The Valley Floor does not, is not kind to Merlot. No. And we had, after we So acquired, you wouldn't use Valley Floor after Merlot. We organi- after we acquired Ornelia. I wanted to have the continuity of terroir there to cite, but also guidance. Michel Roland by that time had succeeded Andrei Chelichev, who was the founding uh, enologist for uh, Lodovico Antonori. But I wanted to have um, Michel Roland carry on, and so I invited him to come to California and to work with us there and to work on Merlot because we needed it. I still didn't, even after working and working and working, I came to the same conclusion, coincidentally, that Christian Moex, who is Mr. Merlot. Petrus. At, yeah, yeah Petrus. he made Petrus happen. He is making... But did you say yesterday that he took Merlot out of Dominus? Yes. It's yeah. crazy, right? Well, it's not crazy. He is smart. I mean, for the right reasons. It's but for all the right when reasons. When you think about so it. So Mr. Merlot, Mr. Merlot, well, Michel Roland... You know, I and but Christian Moex, the guy that actually makes the decision to put it in the bottle, couldn't do it with Merlot there. And um, so, uh, and I felt the same way. The first three vintages of Continuum are based in Tocolon, no Merlot. Cabernet Sauvignon, it was about 53% Cabernet Sauvignon, 30% Cabernet Franc, 23, 21, 23%. Petit Verdot, surprisingly enough. And so, um, and that was roughly the base blend for Continuum because I wanted it to be different than the wines I had worked on before. Um, um, uh, Robert Mondavi Reserve, uh, Opus One, they all are far more Medoc uh, varietal mix. 85% Cabernet Sauvignon, right. 5-10% uh, Cabernet Franc Merlot. And then now, more recently, a little bit of Petit Verdot and Malbec. But I... Uh, but at Continuum, four varietals that do best there. And uh, so we're, we... That's what it's about. It's, it's not... We are we have been doing this long enough to trust our own palates and to not follow what the classification of 1855 was successful in, because they were the best, but to be guided by our own history. And now, after 100 years as a family and after my own nearly 50 years... Uh, being responsible for the wines for my family, um, you know we've we've done this a time or two. So, but we we you had asked about farming practices. Yeah, I was and, just going to come back yeah. to that. So, talk? how do you portray it? Do you portray it as sustainable, organic? I mean, are you touching biodynamics? Are you adding stuff in there? I mean, everyone's using sulfur unless you're like a Loire Valley, no uh, sulfur. I think um, the whole point of the whole nature of being an estate-based winery and having a dedicated estate team is is just continuing to gain your attunement to the nuances of your site from year to year. And um, so our vineyard team is involved in the tastings. And after vacation of those 44 blocks, we have 60, 70 different wine lots. And every year we've been working to understand tie back what's happening in the vineyards to how the wines are showing and how we can be improving things. And so from the beginning, we farmed the way we knew how to farm, which is organic. That's something that we feel passionate about. This site, we're in the nature of reflecting this gorgeous land and, um, and we want it to be healthy for, for the, for the land, for our team, for everyone enjoying it. Um, but you know, there's different interesting bud- buzzwords that come up at every every few decades, like regenerative farming, uh, biodynamic, permaculture, all these things. Biodiversity. I, yeah, well, biodiversity, which we have because we're like as right. I was saying, we're nested in the native vegetation that belongs to that land. But I, so this notion of like permaculture, where you're working within the footprint of your land and everything you're doing is, and if you can't do that, then use organic techniques. And I think so much of what we are doing is what you would call regenerative farming practices, because it is about soil health and everything that we're doing is about maintaining that. Well, you that have to so live for, with this for the rest of, you know, your yeah. winemaking dreams. Right. Yes. So you want to regenerate the soil. Right. You don't right. want, like, so, uh, just as a sidebar, to- mm-hmm. Tokalan is now under, I think, Andy. Andy Beck stuff or whatever under different ownership. Do they continue those practices? 
I can't speak to other people's practices. Yeah, I don't practices. care. I'm just yeah. curious. You know, maybe, well, maybe not. Uh, no, uh, Andy owns, I think, I believe, 89 acres of Tokolon. 80, 80 Robert, acres. 80 acres. And uh, Robert Madavi Winery owns, I think, five. The Constellation. 563 okay. so we, we acres don't care. Yeah. such thing. So totally different par- parcels so within Tokolon. So take me, move me into another thing. Um, one of the things that you talked about, and it was in a good way, was how important science was to the Robert Mondavi Winery, Absolutely. Robert Absolutely. Mondavi University. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, sometimes science could be chemicals, additives, right. acids, right. all of that. So let's move from the vineyards into the cellar. Mm-hmm. Now, how are we making wines? I mean, are we well, let's, manipulating? Are we letting the... Well, I'd like to go also spend a little bit more time in the vineyards because the soil is fundamental. The soil is fundamental. It is filled with microbes. It is, we want that, um, that microbial life in the, in the soil. Protecting the right. microbiome. But the guidelines the we have are health, health of the people that work with us, us, ourselves, health of our consumers, health of the water that uh, is there, health of the soil. And fundamentally, uh, we have to do that. All of these buzzwords that come along one decade, another, another, another. Fundamentally, those things have to be under undergirded by what is healthy for the water, for the soil, for the people um, working and consuming our wine. That guides us beyond anything else. And so, um, so biodynamics you know, uses. You have livestock on your site that you then use right. the, you know, the old ram's but horn. Where we are, there's mountain lions, bears, wild boar. There's a natural, That's not a natural situation for keeping a cow or a goat, like for without right. protection. You're, you're basically setting them out as sitting prey, and so it doesn't make sense for there. our site. <laughs> we've had but go- with herders there, and and we've lost, and, yeah, we've lost exactly. I know. <laughs> so so it's not, that's not appropriate for our site. Right. What's realistic. <laughs> yeah. Not even Absolutely. appropriate. What's realistic. Absolutely. But are we using some other biodynamic techniques? Absolutely. There's such an, that's what biodynamics is about attuning to your site. And that, so we are doing that attuning to the cycle of the moon, knowing that the sap flow is different with the cycle of the moon. All these things are absolutely Think ways that we are incorporating into our farming. But fundamentally, we are trying to go, well, we did a video back at Robert Mondavi in the 70s or 80s. We wanted to go beyond organic. We wanted to go beyond the restrictions that people had because some of them would cause more of a scarring of the earth than and less effectiveness. So we are trying to go beyond that to ultimately understand what is the impact on the water? What is the impact on the land? What is the Im- impact on the microbes within the soil itself? And ultimately, what is healthy for us? Doesn't, so, doesn't Napa Valley kind of suck at that as a general place as far as organics, biodynamics, addressing? You, you're the one who specified water, which is hugely important. I mean, isn't it just a matter of beautiful rows and treatment no, and yielding? No, no, no. I think it used to be that way. It's better? Uh, well, it's That's way, all I want to No, hear. no, no. It is better. It okay. is better. Um, and well, I've got stories about that, too. But um, no, but we You are, don't have time. We wish, we, you know, we wish every everybody was using organic practices. There are certain, like, there are certain, we've been herbicide oh, yeah. free the since corporate, we began the, continuum and pesticide free. And, and, and there are places where those are still used throughout the valley. And it's just a shame. I think I, you'll I, notice, I, I think you'll find that the people that are aspiring to the best, um, are being as good to their vines, as good to their soil yes. and their people as they Always. possibly can. But it is also Is true. that a generational thing? Well, like, it as is, we move, like, you know, as Carissa becomes more prominent, is that more important? Well, yes, it I is mean, more That's important. a good thing, right? It's, it, of course it is. Of course it is. It, it is a wise thing. The, we do need to use science to understand what it, how can we be... Um, uh, kinder to the soil and the water and the microbes of the land and to the health of the people. Because this is, uh, wa- fine wine demands patience. So the people that are really pursuing the best of wines are embracing their most natural of techniques to produce the best of wines. It is the corporations that are now more a part of, uh, of life throughout America that are uh, putting 
uh, quarterly profits ahead of other things and cause people to right. increasingly forget about the long term. So there is no way in hell we could be doing what we're doing today without being without the history that we have and having the financial resources to be able to support our dream, literally our dream, which is to produce something that not only smells great and tastes great, and, but it's got to be good for you and it's got to be good, good, for, be, good for the land. Right. So you and, asked about the cellar and our practices in the cellar. And I think that nat- like wine at the highest level is a natural process and that the you, dad had the benefit of working with so many different varietals. And so um, going to different regions of the world where so many people maybe just focus on Riesling or just Pinot Noir or just Chardonnay or just Bordeaux varietals. And dad, in his in the experiments and in, in what we were doing at Robert Mondavi Winery, he has this now very broad palette to draw from. And so as he was touching on earlier with Pinot Noir, the things that Pinot Noir demands, Cabernet loves. And so our... Um, we do a lot with lees. We kick, kick up the lees, keep it alive and suspended during the time in tank for fermentation. And then after we press it off, we're unfined. And on, no, after we put it into to barrel, sorry, um, we, um, we're, un, we, we, we're unfined and unfiltered and we keep it on the lees. We, we rack sparingly, maybe once or twice in the wine's life. And the only means of settling the wine is really to keep it still in a very cool cellar. And, but we believe that not finding and not filtering, filtering means you, you have more life and, and richness and energy in the, in, and it comes through in the wine. And yeah, our vinification is fairly classically Bordelais. We have no stainless steel tanks, ironically, <laughs> since my father introduced stainless <laughs> steel funny. tanks. It's been uh, half a show talking about that. <laughs> <right>? <laughs> and it is, it is ironic, but uh, it, it is a testimony to us having the, having, uh, the uh, uh, opportunity to pursue our dreams in the in the best of way and to set ourselves up for success and the advancement it of means, awareness and it means know-how. cleanliness building in cleanliness the ability to have an environment that is cool that is microbe um, you know we're not spreading out meticulous <laughs> right uh, meticulous and we have the proper temperature the proper humidity for our oak um, uh, uh, fermenters we have concrete fermenters that are somewhat indestructible, but you have to make sure that they are absolutely right for the vinification and clean. Um, and our barrel room is quite cool um, and because that's what we want to have to make sure that the microbiology is favorable to the wine and not just random. Uh, but cleanliness, uh, good cleanliness is uh, fundamental in the vineyard as well as in the cellar. So you want biodiverse uh, elements in, in the vineyard. And you want natural to set ourselves up for natural health right. in the cellar. So that's where our wines are natural. Every time you find, you take something out. Sometimes you take what you're looking for out. And sometimes you take other things out too. The same is true of filtration. Filtering, right. So we want to raise the wines properly. Not to sculpt them down to make them less than what they are. But to create an environment where they can naturally shine and they can grow into their own best uh, best expression. So when we we got to wrap the show up, not right this <laughs> second, because we have to do the wine list, we have to do the weekly wine sip. Um, I, you've been doing this longer than anyone, so I'm curious to your response on this question, because it's more than a buzzword, it's a reality. Has climate change changed the way you grow and make wine? I mean, do you have to harvest earlier? I mean, has Napa been affected by that? Because, you know, you see in Champagne and Italy, you know, they got all these fires. and Not fires. They're trying to heat the uh, vineyards. The and then protection. the fires in, in California are like a reality now. Yeah, but yeah. let's just keep it in that sort of mini thing of – the Mondavi family what are we and doing? continuum and how it affects. Well, it's first of all, climate change is absolutely real. And if you are a farmer, you get whacked. And I could go through the 15, 16, and 17 vintages, 15 and 16 ill-time. I, or I used to think of, of global warming as ill-time rain, um, either not enough or right. too much at the wrong time. 
Um, a little more but, involved than that. But uh, yeah, I'm not so worried about that so much. But um, in the hillsides, frost in the spring at Bud Break are not that big a deal. We do get nipped every now and again. We did a little, ever so little this year. Uh, but that's not as big a deal. What has been a problem for us is uh, uh, the drought that has caused the vines to awaken early in early spring and then flower closer to winter in early spring. And Mother Nature is saying, oops, I've been too good to you guys, throws a blast of cold air. That's a common. And we had half a crop uh, really? for continuum in the 2015 vintage. The valley floor lost 35% of the crop because of that, um, that cold snap during flowering. Okay, then this, the following year, uh, the valley floor was back to normal, but 16, we lost 20% uh, of our crop um, because of the bud differentiation that took place the prior year wasn't effective. So, and then 17, uh, we had a perfect crop. Oh my God, it was beautiful. We harvested two thirds of everything was in. Uh, we were on the last four days of harvest on Sunday night, October 8th, the following morning, we were going to start the last four days for the last third. And I have never seen wind like we oh, had really? that. So yet another uh, wow. uh, way for mother nature to express her anger at right. us. Well, and you know, winds, growing up, those winds were always cool in the, in autumn, were always these cooling wet winds. These were hot and winds. The, the, the northerly winds that we get now are very drying and so they're very very well sweet. there's also just the power of the wind i've never seen winds up to 50 60 70 miles an hour and so these these winds toppled trees into power lines wow. and ignited fires really there were 17 wind. fires throughout napa and sonoma started the wind with stoked that wind. all the fires absolutely well it caused the trees to to snap Down the power, power lines, lines that ignite ignited the fire <laughs> So that is a, a major problem. And so um, in 17, we lost a third of the crop due to smoke um, because of the fires. In 20, we will not have a drop of continuum. We had two fires, one mid-August. Uh, what do you mean we will not have a drop? Meaning we harvested uh, through the smoke um, because I wanted On to... On the 5th, 6th? Day of the fire, we brought in the remaining fruit that was going to take four days. We brought it in in half the time. Well, you're talking about the 2017 we, I thought that's vintage. what. Oh, you're talking about oh, 20. Well, I'm saying in 2017, we didn't we didn't use any of the fruit that was left out yeah. after that October right. 8th date that was exposed to the fire. But that was you 17. mentioned 2020. 2020. But 2020 was even more severe because we had fires then because the droughts are longer. Uh, the area is dried out more. Um, lightning strikes happen and in August, which was very early in mid August. And so everybody was affected by that. There was another fire, a separate fire that happened mid September, but we were very close to that. Two. So we harvested many, some people chose not to harvest at all, but I said, to your point, this is a new way of, re of, of life. We have to learn to coexist with climate change and 95 percent of our effort had been put in it's in the vineyard so just right yeah this is a, we are a state learning. entity we're in a state entity everything we we produce is we grow from right. our own land so right. when 95 as carissa's saying most of the investment is already there we already have all the people hot, uh, on board and we have a team so we have to learn how to coexist with global warming and the worst of it is fire for us where we are. And so well, that area, for fire the, for, is prominent a oh, problem. It's, it's horrific, absolutely horrific. So the good thing that has come about is a realization that we as a community need to do a lot of work. Um, so uh, we, uh, during that time, our neighbors that own the land above us, the Chapelets, um, cleared a small road into a huge fire break. Ah. And uh, so we are main, we are help supporting the establish that fire break. We are clearing it every year as a community. We are uh, clearing the understory of the garrigue of the, of the chaparral that we have, which is what ignites first from a lightning strike. It is also what then is the tinder that causes the larger trees later to right. ignite. So we're clearing as much of that as we can. You have but to be more conscious. We have that. to be more conscious. The vintners. Well, thank have, God your neighbor. 
the Chapelets. Yeah, are they have done a fabulous job yeah. with that. And I we would have think up on with Pritchard them. Hill, everyone kind of gets it, you yes, know. But maybe yeah. Well, well, yeah, and most, they, they most do. Not everyone. I was going to say it's not. You would but, think it's more evolved, but don't give people too much credit. Yeah, no, that's <laughs> you know? right. That's right. But um, <laughs> overall, though, I think that we are far more fire wise now as a community and we're able you to have things. to be we have to be you have to be we're, so the way you conduct your business because of climate change has pivoted and morphed to a yes a different way well which, we are uh we have been on this long curve towards harvesting a little bit earlier for the wine itself for just the personality of the wine itself not this to is be anything else just the style that you the want the style yeah. we're looking for yeah. because when we first went up to this site um, the tannins were quite powerful and so I purposefully harvested a little bit later to allow the tannins to soften as we are understanding each of the individual blocks better we are understanding some of the elements that contribute to that and we're managing around that both in the vineyard as well as then in the cellar and so we're vinifying differently. We're, but that is, we would do that with or without, without that. But it is also in allowing us to then harvest a little bit earlier as we always intended to. Right. And I have a little angel on my shoulder saying, <laughs> Dad, Dad, let's bring these in a little bit earlier. Yeah. So, Thank uh, God. <laughs> but at any rate, I think that the 19, getting around to the 2019, it is the finest expression. I so believe. hold that thought. Okay. Because when we do the wine sip, which we're going to take the, we're going to taste the wine. We're going to talk about. We're going. We're going to get into what you were saying. But okay. before we do that, I have this thing called the wine sip. I ask all my guests five questions. Two hundred fifty shows, the same five questions. The greatest data bank of wine recommendations. <laughs> so what I want to do is because we don't have a lot of time, I'm going to ask you five questions. I don't want you to dwell on them. I want you to just think what the answer is. Throw it out. I'm going to move to the next one. I'm going to go to Tim first, and then you, Carissa. All right. So the first question, and I post these on our social media, and I have a database of everyone. All right. And I didn't cut you off about the wine because when we're done with this, we're going to talk about it. All right. The first question is, what are you drinking now? What's in your fridge? What are you tasting? What's different? Are the seasons changing? What are you trying? What are you curious about? Give me a few things. Okay. I love uh, crisp white wines, uh, fresh. Uh, uh, yesterday, we had a Gruner Veltliner, which I thought was uh, absolutely terrific for uh, a summer afternoon. Um, so you're drinking seasonal wines now? Seasonal <laughs> wines, as well as crisp Chardonnays. I love Chablis. Um, Do you uh, have any makers you love? Yeah, I, would, I, 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 mean, I have give to me, give, give a little me. bit of a plug to my son's Chardonnay. He has a fabulous <laughs> rain, R-A-E-N. So I want to talk about yes. that for a second. So Dante and Carlo. By the way, he said the exact same things I was going to say. But, so I, that's my answer. That's your answer? <laughs> yeah, All right, that truly, makes my life easy. Truly. So Dante and Carlo make R-A-E-N rain. They make Pino Chablis. So how long have they been doing it? The, uh, 2013 was their first year. I Carlo wanted to go earlier, but I said, Carlo, listen, we have one opportunity to clarify what we stand for as a family. And... Um, uh, so I felt that Robert Mondavi had everything and uh, all the problems were put on his two sons. Well, it wasn't quite that way, but and it, we had something to prove with Continuum. And I wanted clear sailing to make sure that what we said, we did it. We, we said it clearly. We said it clear, uh, consistently and we said it for a long time. So I held him back. I held him back. But finally, in 2013, he went out to uh, uh, begin rain. And it is on the Sonoma Coast. It is a fabulous. Did he make? Wine. Did he make his wine at Pax at any yes, point? Yes, he did. But he's is he gone there. from there? Is he? No, I think he's, he's still there. there. He's yeah. still there. Yeah. Okay. Because I know there's a bunch of cool people making wine. Yeah, and I yeah. know he was. There. It's kind of a nice community. Yeah. It is. So that's Very nice. their Pinot and Chard specialist. That's right. Right. Now, how does that work within the family? I mean, do you help them? Are they independent? Um, I, I remember at Skernick, I tasted it there. So I know Continuum is imp distributed by Skernick. I know Rain is. So I guess it's all the same stuff that way. So that's a good thing. Um, what else can you tell me about that? Well, I'm very proud of my sons. And I... That's I, good uh, stuff. It's very good. It's very, it's like, very good. like 
we've spent an hour and a half talking about attention and perfection in detail. I think that yes. they're doing that too. Which they is are nice doing thing. that. They are doing that. So and look, uh, also inspired by Burgundy. Table, so yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, it's a opportunity for them not to move away, but to focus on something. All right. That's the first question. I'm glad we got Rayanne in because it was here. I said here, we've got to talk about Dante and Carlos one. I was hoping maybe to see one of them at the Skarnik tasting, but they weren't there. All right. Second question, goofiest question of the bunch. Don't dwell on this again. Favorite wine and food pairing. Not something that you think is a good wine and food pairing, but something you like. Obviously, you don't eat it every week, every month or whatever. But what's that ooh-ah? Oh, golly, that's harder. Chris, you want to go ahead? ooh you know, the immediate thing that, I mean... That's all it is, I is just, immediate. Sorry, the immediate thing that you, like, every few weeks, whatever, I don't know. This I'm, I can't say. Say it! I... I mean, I, 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 comfort food, you know, so like a great bowl of pasta and red With. wine, like, um, like a, I've been, I'm really into Etna, like having wines so from volcanic. So pasta and Sicilian wine. Yes, volcanic Sicilian soils. Red. Are we talking and, yeah. Nero de Vola? Um, yes, absolutely, yes. Okay, definitely. so that's your answer. Yeah, yeah. What about you? <laughs> well, I would, I, um... Uh, love stews. I love things. So you of like hearty stuff, and I like older reds. I like older reds, and, and are we talking they're well Bordeaux, made. Old Napa, talking Bordeaux, talking not, Napa, talking not Robert so much Madavi, Burgundy, or, right? Well, but yeah, I okay. also love older Burgundy. Because a lot but of stews Burgundy are made with. Oh, sure, Burgundy. sure, sure. Uh, Buff Bourguignon with uh, right, right, Bourguignon. Right. <laughs> All right. So you like a a, a nice. Stew, and I'm with. thinking of a winter time type okay. of thing. That's uh, oh boy, it's it is. That's when you can relax and really celebrate Sit a long by the fire, night. Uh, reflect that's a, on the that's wine. a very traditional answer, but that's <laughs> yeah. a good one. Pull your heads, pull your minds, and answer this one collectively. Um, and it could be around the winery. It could be your travels in the world. And by answering this, by mentioning people, you're not leaving anyone else, anyone out. But it's just who comes to mind. Favorite wine restaurant and or bar. Where's a place you could walk into where the selection is great, the vibe is cool, the people know their stuff, you feel good about it? Oh, we're, we're, we're talking in our own backyard then. Anywhere. Like where we go normally in Napa sort of thing? Let's or? start Napa and okay. does anything. Well, in- well, top of mind right now is Marea. We were just there with Francesco Rosso at so uh, uh, Marea. Love the, uh, uh, the Italian seafood. He's mm-hmm. got a... a a fabulous uh, selection. And when there, we had a Greek white wine that was absolutely terrific with some of the seafood to begin and a, uh, a terrific uh, Rosso yeah. <laughs> from uh, Etna. It was, and, and the attention to detail that they have, and Francesco uh, uh, is um, such a consummate professional, and it's, the vibe is beautiful. So by the way, terrific. that's the right answer. Incredible <laughs> wine list, incredible wine people came out of there. Victoria James, Christo Zazowski, you know, great people have manned the floors. Uh, Michael White is no longer there, but his menu lives on. But everybody there is very welcoming it's, and it's a friendly place. and, and What about in your backyard? Does anything come to mind or you're too busy and you don't get out? When we're in our own backyard? Yeah, up in what, Napa. Or, what do we want to drink? Well, the, No, what's a good wine restaurant oh, or bar? Oh, oh. No, a um, wine restaurant. A place. Oh, or we, bar. I love, um, well, I have, we have our rotation, like the normal places we go. I love Compline, what those guys right. are doing. I was going to say great. that, but I didn't want to leave you. And the food is delicious, always great fresh. Great food, and, great wine, great yeah, vibe, great Really people. great. And then Torque as well. We're huge Torque fans of Torque. Okay. Terrific. Yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah. Those, let's, let's stop there. Those are good. All right. Fourth question. We're getting close to the end. Favorite all-time wine. When I initially structured this question five years ago, the question was, hey, Tim, you're a baller. You've traveled the world. <laughs> What's like the most expensive rare wine you've ever tasted? Expensive I don't rare. give a crap about that. Because yeah. I know yeah. you, me, Carissa, <laughs> yeah. we've tasted. What I want to know, and we've talked about historically how wide that swath yeah. is. What's the wine to you, and you think about it while he's talking, what's the wine that influenced you the most? What's the wine that was a gateway wine? What was the wine that was a life changer? What's the wine that, you know, awoke you? I'll, I'll have to 
give maybe three. And it could be three. more than one. If Let it, me yeah, give you three, three. I would say the older wines of Mouton were incredible. Okay. To be able to drink with uh, Baron Philippe and to, uh, with Lucien and some of these older wines, I absolutely adored that. But I would also say that without any connectivity other than admiration was going into the cellar with Henri Jaillet many years ago um, and having, I don't remember the year, but I think it was something like the 1980 or one of the best years. And, and everybody was gaga over his uh, um, uh, Richbourg, but his Crow Perron II blew it away. Wow, what an incredible wine. And to taste it, just one-on-one. It's hard to argue that answer. In barrel, in barrel with uh, Henri Jaillet, just one-on-one. And um, one of the best He wasn't a whole cluster guy, right? I know that's right. He was not. He was not. He was one uh, of the guys. And so back then, um, we had been experimenting with uh, whole cluster. And uh, the 83 Robert Mondavi by that time had enough time that it, leaned out a little bit. And after seeing Henri Jaillet and tasting that wine, I got away from Old Cluster. <laughs> I finally went back to a little bit of it on a selective basis by block uh, that we did then. And now Carlo uses 100% Whole Cluster yes. for his wine, having worked at Dujac. But I adored... What's uh, the, you said and three Aubert wines. De well, Aubert de Valen, of the course. Romanese? Of Romany So Conte. Bertrand, yeah. the sun is yes. now jumping in, which is exciting. Right. All right, you? Well, you know, it's interesting. I wasn't going into my experiences, the, those extraordinary moments in cellars that I've been really lucky to be in. But um, then when dad says that, it spurs all these thoughts in me of when my grandfather brought us through and did this a similar sort of trip in Burgundy and Bordeaux and Italy um, with my generation. But my immediate response, is, which is what I'm going to stay with, is was the... Um, for my 21st birthday, Dad, you pulled out some amazing wines from the Rhone Valley, and I actually don't remember what it was, and it's embarrassing to this oh, because I don't uh, know. Do you if remember it was if it was a Hermitage or, 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 or a Saint Joseph? Or? I co- it was. It, it was. No, it, there um, were there are two possibilities. Yeah. One was Chateau Reyes. Yes, I think it was, um, which I absolutely adore, or Jean Louis yes. Chave. Yeah. And uh, either of those two. So the, and maybe both of them, because there was so more the than one. So the answer is like, either the, or, and I love that, because yeah. I'm a big Ronis. So I'm Be- very impressed. Yeah, but I, the, I love but, you more now. But the thing was, for me, it was <laughs> even like. More. The, the, <laughs> even the, more. The profile was just something so unique and distinctive to me that ever since then, whenever I see those characteristics in a wine, I am immediately smitten, because it's just, yeah, that was That's probably the memory. Answer. All right. So I mentioned I post these answers on our social media. Um, last question, and you should be able to answer this because you got pulled into this. You got pulled into this. So I asked my guests, best, recommend to me best wine around 15, 20, 22 bucks. My kids are a little younger than you. They're in their late 20s, 30s. Um, they can't show up at dinner parties or give gifts with crappy supermarket wine, but they can't drop 40, 50, 60, believe it or not. Yeah. You know, we know how all these white wines are priced. Recommend to me, and you guys have to dig deep on this, recommend to me a red and a white. You can give me category, like Muscadet is a great value for white. It is. Give, it recommend is. to me red and white in that price range. Now, when I said it ties into you, ironically, when you went public, you started making wines like Woodbridge and all that that fell in that price range that regardless of what your vision was, they were better wines than the other. Absolutely. You, you know. Absolutely. So tell me, tell me what you think are good wines in that $20 range. Well, you're kind of leading me to remember the f- when we began um, producing the white wines of Woodbridge, uh, the idea that I had was this fish wine that uh, I had tasted in the hills of um, uh, in Switzerland overlooking uh, Lake Geneva. And I will never forget that there was the fellow from Movenpeck Wines took me around. He was a, and we had this lunch with the fish and the, and the bottle was had a fish on it. And I said, wow, this was crisp and simple and so easy to drink. I said, that's exactly what we want for uh, our Woodbridge wines. And we, we fashioned. Was that a Swiss wine? It was a Swiss Which wine. Which never from, leave the country. From the, hills, to... from the hills of Lake Geneva. So and that was, was the inspiration known. for the style. Well, it was. It was. And, and now I would say those that would be more, uh, 
as we talked about earlier, the Gruner Veltliner. Uh, Gruner's um, is, a great white it's value. It's terrific, a terrific. And I Muscadet, agree. I love. Muscadet was also important because Muscadet and Muscadet sur Lee, that reinforces the importance of yeast. So Muscadet sur Lee was the higher category of Muscadet. Right. So because it was nourished by the yeast, again, that's why we are uh, aging for continuum, is uh, surly, as they would say there, but it's more Burgundian. It's more, uh, but there are a lot of great I, ones. I and would say for me, probably grower champagne and uh, Cru Beaujolais. But I don't know if I'm so. I'm going to let you get away with Cru should. Beaujolais. Okay. It may be Village Beaujolais because okay. Beaujolais has popped I don't know up where the in price. Yeah, There's no I'm way you get a grower champagne into oh, that gosh, category anymore. Okay, well, no. let's. But, I, but people hear the answers and all that. That's how hard the question is yeah. to to deliver at that price range and all yeah. of that. Etna, Etna also. So Sicily is producing yeah. white, white and red. White and yeah. red. Right. And I think okay. uh, at re very go. reasonable There's prices. There's our answer. All right. So we're wrapping our show up. And I would like to congratulate the two of you. <laughs> this is the first ever two-hour Grape Nation episode. <laughs> well, there are and two of us. I'm going to be honest sorry, with Sam. you. If anyone could sit here and tell me that it lagged and that we could have even spent more time on any topic, mm -hmm. um, we'd be lying. So, you know, I thank you for sitting here. I don't know where you have to be or whatever, but we're almost there. <laughs> right. So we're going to wrap up the show <coughs> with a segment called our weekly wine sip. So every week we taste a different wine on air. I'm Chaba Perivan, co-host of Agave Road Trip on HRN here to talk about 818 Tequila. 818 creates their tequila using traditional methods that a family owned and operate distillery in Jalisco, Mexico. From the blue agave they grow to their recycled glass bottle, 818 emphasizes the Earth's importance in all they do. Their distillery runs on biomass and solar power, which means they don't rely as much on fossil fuels and are able to reduce their carbon footprint. Their labels, corks, and boxes are all certified by the Forest Stewardship Council as coming from sustainability managed forests. 818 is a proud member of 1% for the Planet, through which they support HRN as well as Sacred, my organization in Jalisco, where together we transform agave byproducts and water waste into adobe bricks that are donated to local infrastructure projects, like a local library in Zapotitlan de Vadillo. Visit drink818.com to learn more about their sustainability efforts and find 818 near you. 818 has been part of so many magical nights for me, and I hope you enjoy it as much as I do. 818 Tequila, imported by 818 Spirits, Manhasset, New York. 40% alcohol by volume, drink responsibly. Did you know that over 70% of diners research a restaurant online before ordering from or going in person? Your digital front door is more important than ever. Let Bento Box design and build you a beautifully branded website. Bento Box websites provide sleek design and seamless content management, creating impactful first impressions and converting visitors into customers. And with built-in commerce and marketing tools like online ordering, gift cards, automated email, and more, you can also grow your revenue and keep your diners coming back. Join over 8,000 restaurants that leverage Bento Box to power their digital presence and deliver great hospitality. Visit getbento.com slash chef today to get your first month free. That's getbento.com slash chef. So we're going to wrap up the show <coughs> with a segment called our weekly wine sip. So every week we taste a different wine on air. A lot of times a psalm comes in or whatever, but when you have a winemaker here, why shouldn't the winemaker come in, bring his wine, and we taste it? So I've asked you to provide a wine, and you graciously did, and of course it's your wine. It's, it's the 2019 <laughs> Continuum, which is your current vineyard in the market, um, it's grown, what do you call it, Sage Mountain on Pritchard Hill? Mm -hmm. Sage Mountain. Right, take it from there. 
And then we're going to evaluate color, palate, taste, well, all that stuff, all right? Yeah, so this is the one wine that we make now. Actually, this is everything we're channeling our family uh, uh, history into now is incredibly focused. Um, and Dad touched on the our setting, but... Um, it really is the culmination of my dad's life work, life's work now to have this in, incredibly f- focused wine that, that we believe is the, the, what best expresses Napa. Um, so this is a unique blend. The, first of all, the 2019 is really special. It's part of why we're here right now. Is uh, it's the our family's 100th harvest in wine. Not everyone could sit down yeah. and say that. And, you know, and it's our. And 15th, as I said earlier, yeah. it's why you're in New York. Yeah, yeah we know. have we have come from wine, and we're still at it at the very yeah. high, pursuing the very highest Which level. That's is hard to say. Like a big deal because you and Auntie Marcy, it's our 15th vintage of Continuum. You guys, with the sale of Robert Mondavi Company, you could have, you know, packed up your bags, found a beautiful island to to enjoy your days on, and and instead you guys you carried on at the same age that. No, no, had been at 53 years old. You started again. That's, that's right. Let's not. So your dad, who everyone knows as Napa Wine Royalty, and you, who are very prolific, you and your dad got into their own wineries at the same age, which yes. is crazy. 53. Yes. Yeah. After and working with our, you know, people for understand working yeah. with the family. Yeah. You know that the the going public and all that, but your dad. I mean, it's just a crazy story. And after the sale of Robert Mondavi Company, my grandfather was still very much alive. And he's like, I don't have a vine to my name. What's the next step? What are we doing? So he was a part of this in the beginning and actually saw the site one month before he passed. And just knowing his tremendous will, I think it was seeing that we had our roots back in the soil that allowed him to let go. Um, But anyway, so what we do is truly to honor the generations that came before. And and it's it's in... So um, this particular... Blend is 50% Cabernet Sauvignon, 37% Cabernet Franc, 7% Petit Verdot, and 6% Merlot. So it's a very high percentage of Cabernet Franc. In fact, on the label is a Cabernet Franc vine. We're big fans of Cabernet Franc, and it grows fabulously Wait, this, well where artwork, we are. Mm-hmm. That's Cabernet Franc? Yes. Isn't that you? My sister Chiara sister. painted that. She Chiara, majored in right. fine art in college. Yeah, 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 yeah. Worked a lot in the vineyards yeah. and the cellar and actually went back to school to get her Cabernet degree in viticulture and enology. from your property? That is, uh, uh, she uh, painted it before we had the property, and so it is a Cabernet Franc vine uh, that I planted in Tokelon, you know, now 30 years ago. So the question is, we know that you've been involved with Cabernet for so long. This has a lot of Cab Franc in it. What is it about Cab Franc that is so attractive to you. Oh, I love Cabernet Aromatics, Franc. body, you know, tell yes, me yes. what it does to your philosophy of making this wine. Yeah. Uh, well, Cabernet Franc is a much more supple, um, um, textured wine. Uh, there is a high, high fragrance, uh, violets in the nose, a silky palate. As it ages, it just becomes so expressive. So aromatics, mouthfeel? Mouthfeel, all of that. Ageability. Absolutely. Ageability. And ageability. And so it helps is, with ageability. It is absolutely terrific. And I think that uh, over time, we are understanding how to uh, improve the quality of our wines, how to make them more complex, more fascinating, more ageable, and also more approachable. I think you see the first growth of Bordeaux becoming much more tender. As we understand each block, every uh, variety better, we can avoid some of the harshness that uh, comes through in the vineyard, by practices in the vineyard, by timing of harvest, by length of skin contact, by, well, many, many different ways of mitigating that, while still also having all the complexity and nuance and fragrance. But this I love this wine, the 19, because I think it is one of the brightest that we have had, yet it also has a richness and the silkiness that does come from the Cabernet Franc and, and Merlot. And it's, the vibrancy that's coming from the, the soil, the volcanic soil. It's incredible yeah. for a young wine. Yeah. It's so drinkable right now. And that's, yet you see it has all the tension that will allow yeah. it to just get better and it's better over time. Young, it's, it's not young. It's not great. I think that the oak fermenters and the concrete fermenters allow... I, I chose them because I think stainless is fabulous, but it retains more of the youthfulness of the wine, which I love youthfulness. 
but I don't like youthful mountain tannin. I don't like youthful but I don't, tannin. No. I don't that's pick why up no a lot of... Well, that's why. No it's yes. why. Because of oak. There's because no, of... I mean, I've had done because where, like, this needs 14 yeah. <laughs> more years, right? Oh, yeah. Well, gone are the days when people <laughs> yeah. would say, oh, wow, yeah. what a wine. I can't drink this wine. My son won't be able to drink this wine. My grandson won't be able right. to drink this wine. But what, good what a that? wine. <laughs> All right. So let's, let's evaluate it. So... I'm holding it over a white sheet sheet of paper, you know, very deep, dark, brooding, dark edges, right? Mm -hmm. Very bright, young color. Uh, has yes. Depth. The youngness the shows end. the richness and the edges are very fresh. All right. Yes. Let's throw it up to the schnoz. And I suck at this. So I def what are the nose descriptors mm. that two things mm. of this wine? Yeah. And do a lot of them carry over to the other? This is your 15th vintage, right? Yes. For Continuum. For Continuum. That's what I mean. So what's the nose descriptor on this wine? And are those descriptors typical of other vintages? I think a characteristic that I always get in our wine that's expressive of our site is the savoriness that you get from the native brush sage and bay laurel is influencing these mm. beautiful dried wild herb notes but it's integrated with where we are you also have these high tone red fruits that come through so this you have that here but also the deeper dark you know blue and black range of fruits but you are get also the in red there fruit on that yeah too, but which more makes high tone which is nice which is what yeah. this site gives us when we chose this site we adored it for its um uh, undulations for its uh, it it has complexity written all over it, and when you see it, it has beauty written all over it. And when you drive around it and you smell the fragrance of the vegetation in the area, it is compelling. It is absolutely beautiful. But you see it reflected in the wine. There is lots of layers. Is that like the old heights with the eucalyptus trees? You oh. taste that, you well, would get the savoriness. No, not I, here. But the savoriness of all that sage well, yes. and brush you, you, comes into I the... I think what you see here is that it is similar in the sense that you get the essence of the vegetation around of the it. area. But uh, Heights uh, was also dominated by eucalyptus. And it became so famous early on. But it was in the wine, was, right? People could see yeah. it. Menthol people kind could of smell it and say, crazy. Oh. Clearly. And people would say, I, oh, that's my wine. I recognize it because <laughs> right. it was so identifiable. But... This is it's more I think, subtle, more much subtle more subtle. And more no, no, compressed. subtle, but you brought up savory, and yes. it's yes. there in a good way. Yeah. And Absolutely. whatever the the place yeah. contributes to it. Mm -hmm. Yes, and right. the four varieties of yes. grapes too, right. in of the course. right balance yeah. and all of that. So mouthfeel, I want to talk to you about two things. Mouthfeel, um, I will go first. I think it's a medium, medium plus mouthfeel. I think people drink Napa wines and they're sometimes too unctuous or glycerin-y or cough syrupy. I don't get any of that here, which I love about that. And that leads me to a question. Napa wines were kind of parkerized. They, they were big, unctuous, fruity. I mean, did you ever fall prey to that? Uh, no, I don't think we did. In fact, I was criticized for having wine a more restrained had, wine had vibrancy. Uh, Robert Parker put me on his heroes list, and then uh, a, a year or two later, heroes because you were doing what he really liked, good, well, and really then good you did what you wanted. And, well, no, I, I would say then the vintage changed, and also a di diversion. And I won't go too much into that because it's a little bit embarrassing, but. Uh, uh, but I would say that uh, he was not a fan of acidity. And so when we had a vintage that retained more acidity, he and we were also absent for various reasons, he pounced all over us and mopped the bathroom floor with me. But uh, he couldn't touch my father. He adored my father. And so all of the, his angst came to came me. Came on you? Because we were also doing a lot of other things. And a lot of other things that I, frankly, I was somewhat against doing so many things. So, so I think fast. acid is good. And I you get your balls broken for having the proper then, acid. Then, <laughs> then, yeah. then. Now, uh, it is wonderful to see that the uh, wine writers of today, I think, are... Um, there's a, there's a, I think Parker was also nuanced. I think he had a very, very good palate. 
But also, he, but it was he a, had a tendency to like bigger yes, wines. And that's why he loved the Rhone wines. He loved the Rhone wines, and he loved lower acid wines. Right. Um, and not, now another uh, wine That critic, has changed. That has changed. Antonio so wait, Maloney, just before you say, wine criticism has become democratized. Because of online, yes, there yes. are bloggers, there are podcasters, yes. there are, you know... But people who write for the San Francisco Chronicle, nobody knew about them nine years ago, but now they're available online. Sure. So there's a lot more voices. There's a natural wine movement. Yeah, there's absolutely. low alcohol, high acidity. Much more so, complexity to your out there. point. Yes. You yes. Know. So there's a lot. And so also the industry is more mature. The industry has grown. America has traveled. It has seen other parts of the world. It is accustomed to a higher level of quality of food today, more open to seeing different cuisines, different types of cuisines, and different types of wines. So the, sing the need for a single voice telling us what to do is far less. So the role Agreed. of the critic has altered. It is there to inform and to, but there, it is no longer a single best that is looked for in America. Uh, it is a multiplicity of options that people are I, encouraging. I agree with that. So the dynamic is enormously swayed, which evolved, which is a huge, hugely beneficial thing. The quality standard of the wines, the quality standard of the foods, the quality standard of the understanding and the demand on the part of the consumer is worlds beyond what it was when I was a boy. I agree. There's definitely been a change. All right, let's finish our evaluation. So my question to you is, let's talk about the palate. Does the palate reflect a lot of the descriptors on the nose? Or do you see, a, you know, that high tone red fruit, the dark fruits? You know, what do you see? Talk to me the about thing, the acidity. The palate is one of the things I learned from, uh, most important things I learned with Opus, there were many, many, many. But Lucy and Ciano, Ta taught me as a winemaker um, that I had relied too much on my the sense of smell uh, as a winemaker because the wines, young wines in the cellar, evolve rapidly. But he said, you really have to look at the palate. You really have to look at that. That is what will tell you what the foundation of the wine. If you have the foundation right, the fragrance will follow. That's interesting because a yeah. lot of people go the other way. Well, and I think it is true as a winemaker, particularly. I think it is as a consumer, it's less important. But as a winemaker, if all you do is judge on wine, then or judge on fragrance, you're missing out its future. That's a transient quality. You know that will evolve dramatically, but the what stays is more the. But but I do think palette. that this wine does have a perfume that is quite expressive. Yes. I'm very proud of that, and that speaks to its gentle handling. All right, so answer Into my mind. question. And then the palate, on, on, on entry, there is a sweetness of entry, a mid-palate that is enduring, and a tannin structure that is uh, strong yet tender. There is a fine quality tannins that are fundamental uh, of importance to me, based on what Lucien told me and taught me working with him years ago, because it does have a through line. Yes, uh, I think. What happens exactly right. to this wine in ten years? The tannins, I which are not a problem. The tannins, I think, they will smooth be in, ta in ten years. The tannins will still that tension They'll will still, still be exist. Silky and but beautiful, even, even more little, silky yeah. and more, beautiful yeah. and more expensive. And the fruit and will fragrance. still be absolutely still, even more so. Yeah. All right. So, last question. We talked about this earlier, but perfect foods to pair this with. If you had that one shot, is it a bloody steak? Is it a burger? Is it red sauce? Another anecdote from Philippe Cotin <laughs> from our days when, when wine and food dynamics were in the air everywhere and umami was talked about and how umami. you had to eat this and how you ha couldn't have that. and how There was a chain called Umami Burger. <laughs> you know? and, and so Philippe Cotin's response is, we were giving birth to Opus at the time. He said, you know, Tim, in, in, in Bordeaux, we think there are two rules about uh, wine and food. First, it must be red. <laughs> and second, it must go with everything. <laughs> That's fair. That's and fair. I, uh, Salmon. 
Yeah, if if the wine is that, that red the, wine doesn't go with salmon, right? If the wine yeah, is balanced, does. and we had great chefs, the great chefs last night were with we were with uh, Danielle. Uh, Danielle. Yeah. What, a, what an amazing man! Oh yeah. my God, he was so wonderful and spent a lot of time with us and said the nicest of things. And anyway, but we've had a lot of these great chefs that would come through, and they would cook uh, fish with red wine, and they would be incredible. Alan Sandoran's was that way. So, there were so many people. So, so it's the, not just, it's, but the wine must be balanced. So the answer, like, other than asparagus or artichokes, this goes with <laughs> or anything. Or oysters. This goes with any, right? Oysters <laughs> the best. Not That's where you grow a champagne. <laughs> yeah. But pretty much, you know, be prepared to drink with it. And I believe in that, that, you know, there's no wine, you know, tradition or anything. Drink the wine you like with the food you like. Absolutely. You know, period. Yeah. My father used to have all kinds of rules about what we could do and what we couldn't do. But towards the end of his life, he said there are two rules, a little bit like Philippe Coutin. Drink what you like, like what you drink. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with that. All right, we got to wrap up the show. I thank both of you guys for this marathon session. And Carissa, I don't think you figured on being here as long as we were going to be. <laughs> no, we're, but this is wonderful. Listen, Thank you. Everything flows, so <laughs> yes, you know, it was hard for me to, you know. I've been wanting dad and, to write a like, book and this and, just proves that, you know. <laughs> well, yes. Yes. And and I'd like to comment on something that it's a beautiful thing to sit here with you, Tim. And with you, Carissa, I've done a lot of shows on generational change and, you know, what new generations are bringing in. And, you know, this project is a great project and I know that you're heavily involved. But the thing that impresses me the most sitting here with the two of you, how the two of you look at each other. You know, I the way you look at your dad, and I know you think I'm crazy. It's like, you know, F this guy, I'm out of here. You look at him with such reverence. And when we started the interview, you said, you know, Carissa and I are going to talk and all of that. So I, I, just the connection between you is so beautiful. And I think that that translates into continuum and the project and the multi-generational thing. And that to me is, you know, more of a charge, you know, than anything else, the history. Yeah, for me as well. So I thank you guys. Let me do thank a quick you. wrap up and I want to get some info from you. So if you have a question, suggestion, wine happening or event, hit me up at sam at the grape nation.com. That's sam at the grape nation.com. Subscribe to the grape nation podcast on Apple podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever you get your pods. The reason we ask you to subscribe is when you subscribe, you wake up and you get up and there's Tim and Carissa with this <laughs> way too long interview that has too much stuff to absorb. But by subscribing, you get everything sent to you. You can follow us on Facebook at The Grape Nation. On Instagram, we're at S. Ben Ruby. On Twitter, we're at Ben Ruby. We know that's a little uh, confusing. But you can always reach us at the hashtag The Grape Nation. As I mentioned, we'll post Tim and Carissa's wine list answers because there's some cool stuff there. And I will post the weekly wine sip selection. You know, I'll mention vintage, you know, some of the things we talked about, because that's the current continuum wine. And this is a winery that makes, you know, only a handful of wines. Now, I got to get out of here, but there's a second wine, Novicium. Novicium, yes. Yeah. And that, explain what that is. Well, you, you will not... <laughs> What was that expression? No, never mind. But, <laughs> but you won't put younger vines into, yeah. but Old you will make a wine. Vines, wines, and people have a lot in common. The good get better with time. Right. Old vines make great wine, but you have to get there. Right. And so what do you do with the young vines? And that's what Novicium is all about. So we everything we have is grown, produced, and bottled within our own estate. And so uh, Novicium is uh, basically there for the younger vines and it is it show I am so delighted with it because it is showing the strength of this site and also the care that even it at a young vine age even at do you young sell vine any age, of the well a lot of people well we are beginning to release it out into the world it's only been on a direct basis uh, recently 
but we are beginning to open it up out in the world. It's and careful, I have careful long term view first. <laughs> Make sure people understand. Yes, continue I on, move but still so not slow. quite there, but okay. I move so slow. You sound so, like Cheshire. <laughs> yes, yes. But um, yeah, right, anyway. So that's Novisium. So listen, I'm going to say something, and you may snark at me a little, but these are luxury wines. Um, the price point is on the higher end, mm. but when you hear about what goes into these wines, the plot, you know, the effort into it, um, you understand why as far as price, I mean, we're not talking crazy prices. I mean, there's Bordeaux and even Napa wines that are well, I exponentially. Apologize. Uh, I, I apologize to other neighbors on Pritchard Hill because we are way lower <laughs> than they. Yeah, <laughs> but that, that, that's what I'm saying. So I just want people to understand. I mean, this is a luxury wine. This is a family wine. This is a wine of history. This is a generational wine. Um, so realize that. Um, if we want to get more information, if somebody said, Jesus, I sat here for two hours and 22 <laughs> minutes. How do I get more information? What's the best place to go to the website? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, www.continuumestate.com. Two U C O N T U U M. T I N U U M. C O N T I N U U M E S T A T E dot com. And there's a mailing Single. list. I don't know yes. if it's yes. open or not, but you can go on and you can do that. It's in restaurants. Sure. It's in some sure. retail and all that. Um, if we want to follow you guys on social media, do you pay any attention to that? Not enough. Uh, <laughs> what about you? More Carissa, yeah. what about you on Instagram? I, <clears throat> currently, uh, I deleted it from my phone rec- like the last few months, oh, but I, oh, I, I, I should re-engage. I love Instagram. We it's do, a, we do, but we don't. We are not as uh, we're under a, a bit of under a rock <laughs> or under <Yeah>. a barrel. <laughs> under, so the wines sell rocks. themselves, and the name no, sells itself. I, but you guys, I'm telling you, you guys yeah. need to get a little more involved into social media. <laughs> I would start with Instagram. We're very old school. Yeah, we are yeah, very yeah, old yeah. school. We travel into the market in person to sell. Each There's nothing in wrong person. with that. I mean, <laughs> yeah. we're well, from the same mistake. generation, but yeah. you need yeah. to get on there. I know. All weird. right. So I want to thank our guests, Tim Mondavi. Tim and his daughter, Carissa Mondavi, um, from Continuum Wines. I want to thank our engineers, Matt and Kevin, and everyone at the Heritage Radio Network. I'm Sam Ben Ruby, and you've been listening to The Grape Nation. The Grape Nation is powered by Simplecast. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network, food radio supported by you. Keep in touch at heritageradionetwork.org slash subscribe.